The only way we're going to get a revival in this country if we all recognize that we are one. Revival is not an event. It's a lifestyle that becomes an event. And all the prophetic words I've ever heard about revival all say the same thing. It's an army of, it's a generation of nameless, faceless people who are going to rise up and occupy their rightful place in Jesus and all heaven is going to break loose. There are no superstar ministries anymore. That day is coming to a close. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ that's rising up. It's the body of Christ that's rising up. It's the army of the Lord that is rising up. Yeah, it's going to have generals and admirals. But it's an army of what everybody else thinks is ordinary people until we do our stuff. A mindset on majesty enshrines our thinking in a particular way. And we've been learning over the last few years how to get a different lens, how to get a different mindset and learn a different language. And that revelation is escalating in our midst. It's not enough to have it just for you and your life. You need to have it for the street where you live, the community that you're a part of. To let it loose on a bigger scale so that people who don't know Jesus are quoting you who do. Teresa and I were at a cocktail party recently for um, people on the floor of our uh, condo at building and uh, we were in our next door neighbors uh, just meeting some neighbors because we just moved in there this year and, and we were chatting away and you know just being ourselves and Teresa's talking to a couple of girls and and they're just they're talking in this really kind of downbeat negative way and so Teresa just says what if it's not like that what if it's like this what if you don't have to think like that? What if you can think like this? What if, uh, what if right now you've got this situation because you're unlearning something about yourself and you're learning something new? What if you don't have to think like that because there's a much better thought here? And a lady looks at her and goes, Whoa, are you a therapist? Kinda. Yeah, we have a different take on things, right? We have a different way of seeing stuff now. We have a different way of thinking about stuff now. We have a completely different language that people in the world don't know how to use because they don't know people like us yet. Or maybe we haven't made our presence felt yet. We have so much to look forward to. So many people we get to practice on all around us. It's impossible to grow up in the fullness of Christ when everything is going well. Okay, take a deep breath. I feel like there's a black hole just about to open up and I'm going to get swallowed up in it. It is impossible to grow up into all the fullness of Christ if everything is going well. You need some difficulties to become great. Don't go looking for them. That would be dumb. Don't pray for them. That would be dumber. But when they get here, rejoice that they're here. Because now God's going to be something to you in a different way thank the Lord for that Amen. 
The purpose of our engagement with presence is to elevate our own identity to the level of majesty that is appropriate in overcoming. You're going to be more than a conqueror. That's our destination. That's our destiny. That's our promise. That's our inheritance. So it'd be good for us to stop moaning and whining and complaining because that's the worship language of hell. We need to rejoice and give thanks because that will elevate everything in us to be more than we need to be for the situation that we're in. In the next year, all of us need to have a record of stories situations where we overcame where we saw something we learned something we came into something we inherited something a promise became real a prophecy got fulfilled a scripture worked out something happened out of the ordinary and that's what makes us extraordinary In learning majesty, I just have five simple steps that I follow all the time. I want you to study them in your own life, study them in small groups, in your, study them in your lighthouses, study them in situations you're in, because they've delivered for me time after time after time. The first step is find a new way of looking at this situation. Upgrade your lens by which you view what's coming against you right now. And part of that is don't look at the situation first, look at who God is. My favorite question to the Lord is what is it you want to be for me now that this situation is here. I like David's perspective in Psalm 34, 5, when he says, they looked to him, to God, and their faces were radiant. I like that. When I first really started to think about that 10, 15 years ago, I said to the Lord, I need a radiant idea of you that covers everything I'm going to face. And I think that's who we are in the globe. We are a people who have incredible sense of majesty, but this radiant idea of who God is and what God is like. And you're not prepared to back down from it. So for me, for my lens, is I want to see God first. It's like I'm pushing the situation aside because I want to see who God is first. And I don't want to, if you look at a situation, you'll react to it. If you look at God, you'll respond to him. The second thing is change the way you think right now. Right now, right now, change the way you think. What's the better thought? Don't ever start a conversation or a question or a thought with a negative. Negativity doesn't belong to you anymore. Jesus died, he paid a price for it, it belongs to him, and he's not letting you have it back. Change the way you think. See who God is, change the way you think. And then you can ask questions in line with majesty. Ask questions in line with who God is. If you don't change the way you think, you'll be asking questions in line with the difficulty, 
in line with the opposition. But when you get a lens of God and you change the way you think, you'll be asking questions in line with who God is and with what God wants to do. And then you'll be fascinated and not intimidated. You know, the measure of terrorism is not in the number of people killed. The true measure for terrorists is in the number of people they can frighten. Don't ask questions in line with difficulty. Ask questions in line with your identity in Christ. Like Paul, read Romans 8, 31 to 39. What shall we say to these things? Question. If God is for us, who on earth can be against us? That's a great mindset. Study the questions in that passage in Romans 8 and work on the answers for yourself because it's genius writing. It's genius teaching right there. The third thing is your language interchange with Jesus. Look at Matthew 16 and verses 15 to 19. Just Jesus and Peter, the language interchange. Jesus is saying... Who do people say that I am? And he got back four distorted images. Some said you're John the Baptist, which is a little disturbing because he'd been murdered a few months ago. That's kind of weird. Some said you're Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. Four distorted images. And Jesus is not asking the question because he's having an identity crisis. He asks us those questions to make sure that we don't have an identity crisis about him. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter just blurts out, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus grins at him and says, yeah, and you're Peter. He was Simon until that moment. Then Jesus said, yeah, and now you're Peter. And on that revelation you have of me, I will build this church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing prevails against the truth that you hold in your spirit about who Jesus really is for you. Nothing can contend against that. So I like language. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. Blessed are you. If you want to be blessed, tell Jesus who he is. That's another one of my daughter's things. She said, Dad, I can always get blessed. I just tell Jesus who he is. And then he has to bless me. And where do you get that from? (laughs) Matthew 16. I read it. It's right there. You are the Christ, blessed are you. (laughs) O-M-G. What made it wonderful in a kind of weird way was she was like 12 and she knew stuff. When I grow up, I definitely want to be like her. And you need to get yourself a powerful promise that you can quote in all your circumstances. I love promises. I love prophecy. I love scripture. I love promises. I love dreams. I love visions. I love all of that creative language. But you need to get promises that you can quote in situations. So I like Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 9. 
God gave him a whole bunch of promises. Why? Because he's coming into a place he's never been in before. He has to lead these people across the Jordan into the promised land. They're going to go to war. They're going to, have, they're going to be fighting for territory. He's got, to, he's got to resupply all his people. He's got to fight all his battles. He's got to take territory. He needs a whole bunch of promises. And so do you. In the context of who you are becoming, you need 20, 30, 50 promises over your life that you get to quote. And I like the idea of that. I've got a difficult situation, but I'm just thumbing through my notebook. Just hang on a minute, Lord. I'm just finding a promise. Oh, yeah. Let me read this one to you. And then read it out. And then just say, Lord, you said... Lord, you said, 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 you said, and now I'm saying what you're saying. That means you and I are in agreement. That means heaven's got a bus loose right here, right now, because that's how it works. My daughter told me. That's how it works. Lord, you said. God gives you a promise so you can speak it back to him when you need it. So you've got to have promises. You need more than 10. If you want to be big, you need around about 50. And then when you grow up and you fit those 50, then God will give you a couple of hundred more because of the people group he's sending you to. Don't think I don't have promises for a glow. Joshua's promise, Josh, every place where the sole of your foot treads, I've given it to you. I don't worry about all the fighting. Every place where the sole of your foot treads, I've given that to you. I will be with you wherever you go. Here's a promise we all have from the Lord. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always. Take that one to the bank. My fifth step is my favorite question. Comes out of Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? <clears throat> and the real definition of the word hard here is is there any situation where God cannot be magnificent? See, if you start with majesty, you end in majesty, and everything in between can be majestic. What if your peace could be majestic? What if your joy could be majestic? I like that. David said, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. I like the word marvelous. It's good for us to marvel. That's not a comic you read. It's an attitude of heart and mind to marvel in who God is, even to marvel in the question. Not sure, I'm not quite sure what you, I know you're up to something. I'm not quite sure what it is yet, so I'm just marveling in advance. Why? Because there's a certainty here, you know. Final thought, then I'm going to prophesy. So, it's not enough to deliver people from bondage to the enemy. We're here to displace him in the earth so that we can transform the planet. You know, there's a poverty mindset about the end times. 
people in all this chaos and people are just crying out to be rescued we just need the Lord to come back so we can escape I don't want to escape I haven't done enough yet I don't think Jesus is going to come back to rescue us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. I think he's going to come back to rescue them from us. We are made for chaos. We're made for war. A third of our language is about war, is about overcoming, is about being more than a conqueror. It's about victory as a right of relationship. These are great days for us. Days to rise up. Days to overcome. Days to go to a different level above what's happening in the world. When economies are crashing, these are days for us to have money, to have favor. to be praying if you own land and if you grow crops to be praying that they're going to be three or four times bigger than anybody else's to be praying for water supplies to be praying for food to be praying for things a rabble of slaves came out of Egypt got formed into an army in the wilderness to take territory And then they went because the promise on them was I will give you a house you didn't build. You can eat from vineyards you didn't plant and drink from wells you never had to dig. A turnkey operation. And when they came out of Egypt, the Egyptians were throwing money at them. Gold and silver. And they came out with enough money to kickstart an economy. Jesus was just a few hours old and kings who'd been in transit for months came and gave his dad a gold brick. I mean, he's in diapers. He's a noise at one end and a smell at the other. He doesn't even know who he is yet and someone gives him a gold brick. Welcome to your world. Welcome to the kingdom extraordinary things are supposed to happen they're meant to happen make them happen these next 50 years we can do 10 times more than what we did in the first 50 maybe more because we know who we are we know what God is capable of What is the expanded vision of a glow that the Lord wants to bestow on us? I believe honestly there is another level that is yours now, right now. You can step into something at this event. Don't go home on the same level that you came. Write down lens changes that you're going to pursue. Write down new thoughts that you're going to use to control your circumstances. Write down the words of a new language that you're going to be speaking. There's a new voice rising up within a glow. And it's rising up in every member, in every region, in every nation. There's a voice rising up that's longing to speak into your circumstances. You're going to have to get used to hearing that voice. Whatever voice you've grown up in in the world is not the voice that speaks to you from the kingdom. Okay, so I've said all that just so I can say this. Aglow, this is your time 
to arise. We've known it for years now. <clears throat> but I believe the Lord is here saying, it would be great if you could arise a bit quicker. This is not the time to ponder things. This is a time to get the mind of Christ and think in a different way. This is not a time to wonder what's going to happen. This is a time to get a new lens and use it. This is a time to get rid of any language that is unsuitable. Get the language of the kingdom. Not the language of the church that may not know the kingdom, but the language of a kingdom-minded people. And if that's in your church, hallelujah. This is time to get the language of the kingdom and lose the language of the world around you. The world says you can't, God says you will. It's your time to arise. This is a closed time to cross over the Jordan of your circumstances and live in the place that God has provided. He's going to teach you occupancy. But you must believe that I am is your footsteps of power. I am is with you. Every place where you tread, when you're walking down your street, it belongs to you. When you're walking around your place of work, it belongs to you. When you're walking through your neighborhood, it belongs to you because you belong to him and he's a territorial spirit. He's the one true, great, original, territorial spirit. And in the book of uh, Joshua in the book of Judges he marks out territory for, for every tribe in Israel what's that? that's a territorial spirit in action anything else is just a copy he's the one great original territorial spirit and he's marked out territory for you in the city where you live in the community that you inhabit, in the circumstances of your life. And he's going to teach you how to occupy that ground until he comes. And the Lord says to you, walking in the Spirit is about acknowledging that every place I take you belongs to you for the time that you are present. And I will teach you to occupy in the place where you live. I've marked out the places where I'll give you specific authority to overcome as you learn the secrets of majesty. There is no power that can successfully oppose you on the level that <clears throat> you inhabit in the beloved Son. You are a habitation of God. Live there. Don't live in a lower place of expectancy or faith. All your low places will become high places. And as you reign in your low places, so I will elevate you to inherit more. There's more that I need you to have. There's more that the world needs you to have. The world is crying out for wisdom, crying out for vision and leadership and power and faith and consistency. The world is crying out for goodness and kindness. And you're it. As I was with Jesus, so I will be with you. So that the power of my words will reside within your heart and my favor would abound towards you.
Favor is not a small thing. It's not a parking place on a busy day. Favor is a huge thing, a massive thing. And you're growing up through all the stages of favor so that you will have favor for a people group. Think of it. A glow turning all their favor on Israel. Think of that. In the Islam mandate, a glow turning all their favor on the Islamic world. That they get turned over by Jesus. No need for weapons of mass destruction. The Bible's enough. Truth, power, presence, majesty, favor. And the Lord says, I will not ever leave you, nor will I fail you in any way. I will be with you always. Look for me in your circumstances and you'll find me. Look for me in your neighborhood, I'll be right there. Look for me in the chaos, I'll be the one smiling and grinning, thinking of something marvelous to do. But look for yourselves in those places. See yourselves in those places. Hear the words of wisdom that can come out of your mouth. You be the one that prays the one prayer that matters, that opens up, that causes the kingdom to descend. I believe one of the things we'll be doing in a glow is writing crafted prayers for our city. Asking the Lord, what are the promises for this city, for this community, this town? What are the promises about employment, about sickness, about marriage? What are the promises over this place? And then writing prayers in line with those prophecies and promises and praying them, walking the streets, and releasing those prayers of blessing. I believe the Lord would say to us, you know I can always do more. Work with me. The enemy seems powerful right now because the church is doing very little. We're too busy looking at ourselves. And we should be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We should be writing crafted prayers and praying them week in, week out, month in, month out. Pray until something happens. They're called push prayers. Pray until something happens. And those push prayers will push the enemy right out of your community. There's another level of intercession. That is not linked to supplication. It's linked to promise and prophecy and purpose. It's linked to the majesty of God. The Father says, be careful to follow in my wisdom. Receive my perception and think the same thoughts as I do regarding your favor and your blessing. Don't turn away from favor. Step into my abundance. My will is to promote you. This is your time to regain my strength and power, to learn the way of courage, to overcome, and to see yourself as the giant, to see yourself as the eagle, to see yourself as a man and as a woman of power, 
and it doesn't matter what is against you because you know who God is in you and who God is for you. And none of that's going to be easy. But it can be really joyful. It can be energizing. It will be exciting. And you'll learn how to overcome when everything's against you. And then nothing will be impossible for you. If these are the end times, we need an end time army. If these are the end times, then we need to start reading the book of Revelation as a devotional tool. Because when I read the book of Revelation, all I see is the majesty of Jesus. He's the one that calls the shots. He's the one that releases this and releases that. And unless he releases it, it's not going to happen. So the whole book of Revelation is a huge exercise in majesty and sovereignty. Because in the midst of all of that, he'll do far, far more than what the enemy is released to do. We're learning our real identity here. And we're not grasshoppers. Let's pray. Father, we are not tired and we're not weary and we're not beaten down by life and circumstances. We're not broken. We're unlimited. We're boundless. We have this huge amount of favor we have a lens that sees you. We have a mindset that understands your way of thinking. And we have a language that came out of heaven that allows us to talk to things in the earth and make changes. That allows us to declare and proclaim and confess and we confess to you that we are those people who can take territory. We are those people who live in proclamation, who love declaration, who always have a fascinating confession of who you are. And I thank you for where we stand. We're poised on the edge of your greatness and you're going to push us over the edge so that we free fall into majesty and we just want to say to you we're ready not just to be in it ourselves but we are ready to be leaders in this movement who will lead a glow across the Jordan into a new land, a new state of promise. That we are leaders and we're going to stand up and we will make a difference because it's given to us. It's not in doubt any longer. We are those men and women, those women and men. We are those people. We confess to you. We can do all things through Christ who will strengthen us. We are those people. And so, Lord, I bless the leadership gift on everybody in this room. And I ask you to take us to levels that we've never thought on, never seen, never spoken about, never touched. That there is a place set aside for us, a realm for us to inhabit, to move up, to step up into and it belongs to us now and it's within us now and we can leave this place walking at a new level 
because that's the good pleasure of your will toward us. And so I ask, Lord, that we would have the blessing and the permission to fully inherit all that belongs to a glow.